When the killer thinks the cameras are off. Oh, I still have it on super speed, I forgot. Wait, no, this is normal now. I knew I must have done something wrong. Good old thumbs yeah, up. I found her in my house. She's kind of... I oh my god, is that I real images? I'm so worried about her. Oh god. This is this kind is of This is 30-year-old Matthew Hoffman. He's just been arrested at one of the most bizarre crime scenes ever, filled with something so strange that you'll have to see it to believe it. After sitting in complete silence for hours, in approximately three seconds, you'll see him finally crack and speak for the first time, admitting that a missing 13-year-old girl was found in his basement. I can't tell you anything so I don't know. But what he says next is completely unexpected. When Valerie Haythorne I became could concerned not read that, that something horrible had happened to her co-worker after she failed to show up for work, she broke into her house only to find a disturbing scene. However, she would soon discover that her co-worker wasn't the only one missing, and the truth of what happened was even more horrific than anyone even feared. I guessed IRL. The nightmare began on Wednesday, November 10th, 2010 in Apple Valley, Ohio, when 32-year-old Tina Herman, a reliable employee at the local Dairy Queen, missed a day of work. For most people, this wouldn't be a big deal. However, she also wasn't answering any texts or calls, all of which was highly unusual for her. Concerned for her well-being, Valerie Haythorn, of course it's Tina's Ohio. Manager, oh my to drive by her God. house and make sure everything you was You guys okay. are unhinged. <laughs> she saw Tina's truck Is was in the driveway the with another unknown car and that the lights were I on guess inside so. the house. But she still felt like something wasn't quite right. She called the police and told them that Tina hadn't shown up for work. Sheriff Barber's office. Hi, my name is Valerie Haythorn. Uh-huh. And I work out at Dairy Queen. I'm the general manager out there. Uh-huh. One of my mm -hmm. employees did not show up for work this afternoon at 4 o'clock. Okay. You know, which is totally uncharacteristic of her. She's one of my managers. Okay. I drove out by her house and went and knocked on the door and left her note. She's not answering her phone, which is totally uncharacteristic. She's not answering her text, and she is not at home, but her truck and her coat are in the house. Her truck's there, and her coat is in the house. I'm very concerned about her. What's, what's her name? Her name is Tina Herman, H-E-R-R-M-A-N-N. -N. Tina? Okay. Uh, I know that she and her boyfriend are splitting up, and he can be a real jerk with her. Okay. Do you have a phone number for her? Um, oh God, I do, but it's in my phone. I'd that's, have to call you okay, back. Okay, that's okay. fine. What was your name again? My name that's is Valerie the caffeine. Thorn. Oh, God, okay. it's too carbonated, okay. isn't it? Uh, it is uh, carbonated. I'll have a swing out there and check on her. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank Anytime. you. Anytime. Uh -huh. Bye. 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 Responding rather quickly, two different officers at different times showed up to check the residence, but when they knocked, no one came to the door. They left the matter unresolved. The next what? day, an officer called East Knox Schools to find out if Tina's two children, 13-year-old Sarah Maynard and 10-year-old Cody Maynard, had been in school. They were told that both children were in school on Wednesday, but hadn't shown up on Thursday. Soon, a man named Ron Metcalf was also contacting the police because his girlfriend, 41-year-old Stephanie Sprang, appeared to be missing. She was Tina's best friend, and they'd been together before he lost contact with Stephanie. Ron had last spoken to Stephanie around 12.45 on Wednesday, but she hadn't answered any of his calls since then. Around 4 p.m. on this same Thursday, Tina's determined boss, Valerie, decided to take matters into her own hands. When she got to Tina's house, she noticed that Tina's truck was now gone from the driveway and only the unknown vehicle was left. This vehicle would turn out to belong to Stephanie. When her knocks on the front door went unanswered, Valerie decided to enter the house using an unlocked window on the back porch. Once inside, she saw blood in the bathroom and on the carpet, oh as well as splattered throughout the home. She immediately left the house and called this? the police. That's really graphic. It is, it's, it's, it's showing like, actual <laughs> photos. Yes, this is Valerie Haythorn. Uh -huh. I called in last night about Tina Herman being missing. Uh -huh. I am out at her house now. I just went in her home because I'm so worried about her. There is blood everywhere. Okay. Where uh, are you at? I'm sorry. I, uh, I just got back today, so. Okay, okay. So you just need to come what kind of cop? Tina Herman works for me. She did not show up for work yesterday, and we have not been able to locate her or her children for the light. It's been 24 hours now. Uh, I just spoke with... No, I'm sorry, ma'am. Okay. I just I'm need sorry. an address. What I just need an address. 481 uh, Kings Beach Drive in Apple Valley. 
Okay. Just give us a few minutes and we'll ha we'll be in round, okay? Okay, sounds Don't good. go back in the house. I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying in the driveway. Okay, thank back you. All right. All right. Bye. 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 Oh By Friday, November God. 12th, the police were officially investigating four disappearances. Tina, Sarah, Cody, and Stephanie. The family dog, a miniature pincher named Tanner, was also missing. Oh the house my. was searched for clues, and the first discovery was very <gasps> disheartening. The initial crime scene investigation concluded that the evidence indicated assault with bodily injury, including a large amount of blood and what looked like drag marks leading to the bathroom. There was also blood on the top of the basement stairs and in the basement. Something terrible had happened in Tina's home, but the exact extent of the horror still wasn't clear. What the is first it, suspect bro? in the disappearances was the most obvious. Right at the beginning of the investigation, the police were told that Tina and her boyfriend were in the middle of a breakup, and her friends were worried that something may have happened between them. Gregory Borders, Tina's live-in boyfriend, who was not the father of her children, was interviewed immediately after he came to the police station voluntarily. In his statement, he admitted that he and Tina had split up, but they were still living in the house together until either of them could make other arrangements. Interestingly, Gregory normally cool? has Wednesdays no, off from bad, work. The day Tina no, went are you cold? But he decided no, to work overtime cold. at Target Distribution hey, in West Jefferson, cold? Ohio, She's like, about one and a half hours away. It's this thing's he intense. worked from 6 a.m. to 4 p.m., but instead of coming back home, he said it's he stayed always the at a friend's house in Urbana as they had plans to play golf toxic and relationships do to you. It all seemed very convenient, except that all of his time was accounted for. <laughs> well, his friend verified that they had know, dinner together and stayed in watching TV. Walkers. Gregory received a call from his mother around noon on Thursday, and she told him that Tina was missing. But instead of panicking and coming to help look for her, he just assumed she took the day off and continued to golf. Gregory Crazy. only realized his assumption couldn't have been more wrong when he finally returned to the home he shared with Tina. There he found that an investigation into the disappearances had already begun. <gasps> After investigators cleared the crime scene, Gregory's own family arrived with bleach to clean up the blood in the house so that he wouldn't have to see it. With Gregory cleared, investigators had to move on to other leads. The next development was on that same Thursday when Tina's vehicle was discovered abandoned in the campus parking lot of the nearby Kenyon College, with no sign of her or anyone else. But it was something at the crime scene back at Tina's house that soon became the most promising piece of evidence. Investigators found Walmart shopping bags containing two tarps and a box of heavy-duty trash bags. Now, that's not a good sign at all, but in this case, it was also the investigation's big break because, along with the shopping bags, they also found a receipt for the purchase. Detectives wasted no They're time requesting the surveillance everywhere. footage from the Walmart in Mount Vernon and began scouring it for someone making the suspicious purchase of garbage bags and tarps, oh. along with a turkey sandwich and a t-shirt which was seen on the receipt. It wasn't long before they found Easy. him buying the items just after midnight Got on him. Thursday morning. Just to be sure they had the right guy, Investigators obtained a copy of the receipt from the suspicious transaction and compared the product codes with the receipt they found at the crime scene, and they matched. <gasps> oh! The suspect was a white male, 25 to 40 years old, with brown hair, wearing a camouflage shirt and glasses. He was Camo caught on the footage shirt leaving did the Walmart in a help him hide from those cameras. <laughs> Using That's still images sure. of the suspect, the investigators used the Ohio Law Enforcement Gateway to search for any owners of a silver Toyota Yaris. It was then that they found a name, 30-year-old Matthew J. Hoffman. His vehicle appeared to match the surveillance video, and in his Ohio BMV photo, taken only 16 days before the Walmart footage was caught, he was even wearing a camouflage shirt similar to the one in the video. Obviously, the police knew they had to talk to him, but Matthew had two possible addresses. One belonged to his mother, Patricia Heglin, and was only 0.4 miles from Tina's home. The other was registered under his name and was only 10 miles from Tina's. If there was any doubt that Matthew was the right guy, a search of the Knox County Sheriff's Office revealed that he had actually been stopped near where Tina's van was found within the same hour that it was discovered. An officer had stopped him to ask why he was in the area, but believing nothing was amiss, let him go. The Sheriff's Office also revealed that there was also a report of domestic violence between Matthew and his then-living girlfriend that occurred about one month before the disappearances. During an argument, Matthew allegedly choked his now ex-girlfriend. 
It was also discovered that following the breakup, Matthew had just recently been fired from his job as a tree trimmer for apparently making his supervisor uncomfortable. His ex-girlfriend was contacted, and she told the police that Matthew no longer lived at his mother's house and hadn't for several months. Finally, the police knew where to look for Tina, Sarah, oh, Cody, God. and Stephanie. Once search warrants were obtained just three days after the disappearances, a SWAT team descended on Matthew's home. Because they weren't sure if Matthew had kidnapped the four people, they conducted a no-knock search and used a ram to force entry through the front door. They then threw in a flash grenade before they entered the home. What they found was more bizarre than they could have ever expected. Matthew was asleep on the sofa. He resisted a little by not showing his hands when asked, but he was quickly arrested and removed from the home. As soon as he was taken care of, officers noticed something particularly strange about the house. What? There were leaves everywhere. What? The living room floor was almost completely covered in a huge pile of leaves. What? At first, the police were worried that the leaf pile might be hiding something sinister, like a body. But after searching through, they were relieved to find that this wasn't the case. What? Still, things only got weirder from there. There were also bags of leaves lining every wall of the bathroom. After breaking what? down the door of a locked bedroom, police what discovered what looked like a marijuana <laughs> growing operation that was not active. In a freezer, they found two dead squirrels lying right next to a few red popsicles. What the, heck? But the what? biggest surprise was hidden in the basement. A cabinet was blocking the doorway, but once moved, an officer discovered Tina's daughter, Sarah Maynard, lying on a sleeping bag on top of a pile of leaves in Matthew's basement. Her feet and hands were bound with yellow rope and duct tape. Alongside her in the basement were more trash bags filled with leaves. Thankfully, Sarah appeared to be unharmed, but she was wearing a makeshift diaper made from a plastic bag. As officers approached her, she was very confused and told them that she was late for school and kept asking if they knew anything about what happened to her dog, Tanner. Sarah was likely in shock or possibly dissociating. When something very scary or traumatic <laughs> happens, someone may dissociate to protect themselves. They may feel disconnected from what is really going on or as oh though they're gosh, in a dreamlike state because reality is too difficult to face. Oh God. Have you ever gotten in the car to drive home and then suddenly you realize you're almost back but you don't remember the drive? That is a very mild form of dissociation. There was no sign of Tina, Cody, or Stephanie anywhere in the home. Investigators took care to photograph the way Sarah was bound oh, before they freed her and brought her upstairs yeah. to wait for medical Ooh. attention. Sarah was then brought by EMS to Knox Community Hospital, where she was thoroughly examined and questioned. Despite the trauma she'd endured, she carefully outlined every detail of what had happened. She said that she and her brother had returned home from school on Wednesday and were attacked by Matthew as soon as they entered. She ran to her bedroom, but Matthew grabbed her and carried her down into the basement. There he found some rope that was already in the house and used it to tie her up. He then left her on the kitchen floor for a period of time. She wasn't sure how long before he put her into Stephanie's Jeep and drove her to the Howard Ballfield parking lot. He covered her with blankets and left her there. Oh, Matthew later returned baby. and put her into another car and drove to his house. Once there, he bound her hands and work gloves and duct tape, had her gagged and kept her locked in the bathroom in a closet before he put her into the basement. Sarah said that she believed Matthew had killed her mother, brother, Stephanie, and her dog, but she wasn't sure. She revealed that during the time Matthew had kidnapped her, about four days, he cut her finger with a knife, repeatedly assaulted her, and said that he was going to release her before what? Christmas. But he never told her what happened to her mother, brother, or Stephanie. After being medically cleared, Sarah was then released into her father's custody. Initially, after he was arrested, Matthew was placed under 24-hour watch after crying and threatening to harm himself. Eventually, though, he was brought in to speak with investigators. The following interrogations took place over four days, and have never been analyzed before. <gasps> the interrogator reads Matthew his Miranda right. Okay, hold on. I have to turn the AC off. I am so invested in this. Are you comfortable? You want a different chair? No, I'm good with this chair. Are you sure you want a cushion at least? No, I'm good. It looks so uncomfortable. No, I'm pretty used to this, but this... Bro, that actual photos is going to Dude, make me so sad. Those are all instead actual photos. This is disgustingly sad. It, this is way more horrific than jcs videos don't you think chat i know jcs is all about the interrogation yeah. process but this is actually showing like real 
photos. Crazy. I'm so cold. Holy crap. Are you cold? No. Oh my gosh, she's invincible. I mean, I brought a jacket, so if I do get oh, cold, geez. I do have a jacket. I also, I got a jacket. <laughs> this is scary. Brr. Yeah, JCS is more psychology, so it's like, it's not as like intense to watch, but it's still like, you know, interesting to see the psychology behind the inter in uh, interrogation process. Brr. Okay, are we ready? Here we go. But he's almost completely unresponsive and barely even acknowledges the detectives. Bottom paragraph says, my rights have been explained to me and I understand each of those rights. Having those rights in mind, I'm willing this time to make a statement or answer questions. You understand that, man? Yeah. You understand? It's possible that Matthew is in a catatonic state, which can occur with some psychological disorders, including schizophrenia. When the person is experiencing catatonia, they may be completely unresponsive with their body, like Matthew is now. It's also possible that this is his way of coping with the stress of the interrogation. Someone who is under extreme stress may limit their movements in an effort to go unnoticed, also known as freezing. Of course, it's also the possibility that he's refusing to cooperate to intentionally avoid having to answer questions. You want to talk to one of us alone, or do you want us both in here, or are you comfortable with both of us being here? Man. Oh my god, wake up, bitch! Soon they start to get creative in the hopes Look that Matt will begin talking. Oh <laughs> hey Matt, you, can I ask you a question? You look familiar. You look familiar to me. You uh, work out the gym? We saw you on the cameras, bitch. He finally Dude, I'm reacts, pissed. I hate this guy. This is one of the most bizarre things we have ever seen in an interrogation. You know, other people, there's family members out there of other people, and they all they want is closure. That's all they want. They've been up for days like you and I have, you know? Heart hurts. I don't. I don't understand sign language, man. Matthew's hand signals seem to say that his heart is broken. This is, of course, not real sign language. However, it's certainly odd that he's using hand signals to communicate, but this could be an indication of Matthew's childlike nature. What do you want from us? What? Tell me what you want from us. What? Matthew sits with his eyes closed as the detectives try relentlessly to get him to start talking. We want a couple minutes here just to kind of... Think about all this, because I know it's overwhelming for you right now. I'm beginning to think Matt don't care. He cares. The detectives are speaking as if Matthew isn't in the room. What? They're likely trying to see if something they say strikes a chord and makes him want to chime in to correct their assumptions about him. When this attempt doesn't work, the interrogator tries another, more confrontational approach. Somebody will cry today. If I make a phone call after this interview, somebody will cry, but I guarantee you, some of that cry will be joy because they know where Cody is. They know where Tina is. They know where Stephanie is. I know they'll cry for somewhat joy, Matt, because I've already heard it with, with Sarah. Matthew tightens one hand into a fist and then covers it with the other hand, a sign that he's feeling very anxious. What I'm probably gonna do, Matt, is leave this room and when I get away from these guys, probably cry like a baby. Because it's working on me, man. Big time. Finally, after sitting in silence and almost completely unresponsive for over four hours, Matthew cracks. Four hours! I can't say anything, so I don't know. You don't know? I knew I must have done something wrong. And I found her in my house. She tied up. And so I took care of her. Psychopaths yes! often try to paint themselves as the good guy or I'm the I'm sorry. Hero. Okay. It took him four hours to realize that he, he was going to say, I don't know what happened. I found this girl tied up and I'm going to take care of her. Ugh, Four hours. Crazy. Insanity. Bro, like Matthew did here when claiming that he took care of Sarah. 
This is a sign of antisocial personality disorder, also known as ASPD. However, when someone with psychopathy does something horrible, they will sometimes pick out one positive thing they did in the midst of all the horrible things in order to oh, claim that they are this good. Is stressing me out. What Matthew claims he had done to, in his words, take care of Sarah was feed her, let her watch the movie Iron Man, and allow her to borrow his copy of the book Treasure Island. How do we know anything else? So I was trying to figure out what had happened. Matthew's claim to not know what he did is one of the mysteries with psychopaths and people with severe personality disorders because they sometimes dissociate and can't recall their actions. This is particularly true for the very mentally ill psychopaths, such as someone with psychopathy mixed with psychosis. Other That's times, so their scary. supposed inability to remember is just their way of manipulating and pretending that they weren't aware of what they were doing. At what point did you find your time at the house? Thursday? Thursday. Did you... Ask her, did you speak with her about, you know, what happened? How did you get here? You know, anything like that? She said, I've done it. I figured I had done something I didn't know. I just could try to put pieces together. It still isn't clear what happened to Tina, Cody, or Stephanie, or where they are. However, given the still? evidence of blood found in the home and Sarah's testimony that she believed Matthew killed them, investigators weren't hopeful that they would be found alive. Did you recognize her as someone that you had seen before? And, you know, did you realize that this is a person you'd seen before that now was in your house? Or I don't know did her. make that connection? You don't know her? I mean, I'm just asking because they were the pictures on the camera and they weren't taken, you know, at the time that this happened. So I was just wondering if you, you know, in other words, if it was someone you knew and then, wow, why, how are you to get here in my house? But she said that she asked you a couple of times. Do you, do you remember that? Childlike behavior is very typical of people with personality disorders, including ASPD. However, Matthew is extremely childlike. When under stress, psychopaths and many people with ASPD often regress to childlike behaviors, but they often do so knowingly as a way to attempt to manipulate their way out of consequences. A female officer, believed to be a psychologist, enters the room and begins speaking with Matthew one-on-one. -on -one. She set up the room differently so they're more side-by-side -side instead of across the table, which doesn't allow Matthew to have the barrier of the table between them, keeping take his, his distance barrier and away. guard up. I think what we were talking about earlier and kind of feeling alone, and that's definitely how I felt when I went to Chicago. I knew no one there. I was the only one out of my class sent there. The interviewer is trying to build rapport with Matthew and trying to make it seem like she can relate to him, possibly feeling lonely in a city where you don't know anyone. This is to make him feel less judged and to start moving him closer to a confession. But you had a purpose. Yeah. Ikigai. What's that? Japanese. Oh. Ikigai. It's a purpose. Mm. She latches onto her comment about a lack of purpose. She'll now likely use this as the theme for why he did what he did as he was receptive to it. This is a step in the read technique of theme development. When developing themes, the interrogator speaks in a soft, soothing voice to appear non-threatening and to lull the suspect into a false sense of security. So I did go out to Colorado after I graduated high school. I did. That's where I got into my first trouble. Into my first it's trouble. something really bad. I pieced it together. I figured it out. And I went and turned myself in. That was my first prison time. She went out there with a sense of purpose. Oh, I don't. It is clear he likes playing the victim role, and the interviewer will allow him to seem like a victim to get him to confess. But admitting that he had done something very bad in the past, it shows that he has some awareness of what bad is, so, if there is any doubt that he he's didn't insane, miss much. this could show that <laughs> he's just a new interviewer. She moved the table insane. to take away his barrier. Oh, he's talking about his first bad thing he did. In 2001, Matthew was convicted of arson, burglary, assault, and motor vehicle theft while in Route County, Colorado. 
It's believed that he set fire to a vacation condo to hide any evidence that he'd been staying there without the owner's permission. He was eventually released from prison and paroled back to Ohio. It's okay. You didn't want to hurt anybody. You just wanted to release. Ugh, the investigator now offers a justification for his so actions. So weird seeing he just people that murder people and cry. didn't want to hurt anybody. Yeah, this is another read technique like, used to make him feel more at ease with admitting to the ew, things he did. As she's that. proposed a more morally acceptable reason for his actions that he can latch on to. I don't want to hurt anyone. It's not me. Right. Again, her tactic works, and he repeats what she said. You know what antipsychotic medication is? Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't hereditate. It doesn't directly address the problem. Mm -hmm. It's just powerful it tranquilizers. Mm -hmm. I'll take it if I have to. I don't really be a teacher. <laughs> it's interesting that Matthew agrees he will take an antipsychotic medication if he has to. It appears that he may be trying to claim that he is psychotic or was acting due to psychosis when he committed the crime. That's crazy. Why do you think that? Yeah. Worse than just something bad. Yeah. I wouldn't be here if I did Wow, that can be worked through. Again, he's playing innocent and claiming to be unaware of his actions. This is not a believable tactic. And hearing this, it's easy to assume that he's lying and manipulating or playing crazy to try to get out of the consequences. Oh, he knows God, he's facing. pissing me While off. this could be the case, it's also possible that Matthew has gotten used to dissociating throughout his life, meaning that he copes with whatever unpleasant or uncomfortable feelings he experiences after doing something bad by completely erasing it from memory. This isn't a totally conscious process, of course, because people can't consciously decide to erase something from memory. However, this type of dissociation is something a person can learn to do as early as childhood, particularly people who have gone through severe abuse during childhood. In addition, detectives found an extremely large number of leaves inside Matthew's home. This is certainly unusual and may be a sign of a severe mental health disorder. One of the symptoms of schizophrenia is delusions in which the person may hold strange or odd beliefs. Although Matthew has made no mention of the leaves, it's possible that he holds some type of delusion involving leaves. The sheer amount of time that it would have taken him to gather that many leaves and bring inside lends support to the theory that he likely has a very strongly held belief about the leaves. Okay, potentially, and I can't, you know, guarantee these things. What facility you might go to, you know, where you might go, what might happen, and the, and the, and the attitude that the people in the system are going to take toward you can be affected by the fact that you decided at this point to do the right thing. The male detective takes a very different approach with Matthew than the previous interrogator. He's much louder, more aggressive, and more direct. From the moment we broke into your house, found you and found her in the basement, you owned it all. You own it all, okay? You can't do anything about the part of it you own. Matthew clearly doesn't respond well to the detective's assertive and somewhat aggressive approach. It appears that he's covering his ears with his arms, possibly trying to block out what the detective is saying. I would totally be the bad cop. I don't have patience. He's silent again, and the detective allows the silence to linger in the hopes that he will make a decision as to whether he will confess. The detective mirrors That's, Matthew's that would posture be and body language here. No, you'd be I, I, him be I would, I would literally Matthew's personal be space. like... It could also be the detective's way of trying to connect with Matthew. Cross the my hands. The intensity appeared to cause Matthew to become more distressed. However, by mirroring his body language, the detective is relaying a message of understanding. And you know, you, I mean, you, if you didn't have a plan and you just put him in the Jeep, if you just pulled over somewhere, there's weeds in the Jeep, so it looks like it's probably pulled into a field somewhere and that's how the weeds got on there. If it's a random place, give me an idea where the street it might be on or off of. But you gotta be able to narrow the field down from the whole county. And the dumping itself has to be less traumatic to recall than all the stuff that went on in the bathroom. Yeah. Just, just tell us where to look. And I will stand up in court and say that you did. 
and I will, I will go, I will go to Sarah myself and tell her that you did. The detective returns to this theme that has Matthew looking like a good guy. He even uses Sarah seeing him as helpful as a bargaining chip. I don't want you to get upset, but the reason we're driving around, and we don't have to drive around. Okay, remember I came in here saying that I didn't want to drive around unless there was some value in it. Okay. Right. That's the whole point is will you see something that will, you know, prompt your memory? But I want to talk about I want to talk about what what the possibilities would be for that location. Okay. In other words, not across the street, you're not gonna put bodies across the street. What would you do? you know, from there, you know, in terms of a place you might go. Matt, we're not going to be mad at you if you don't know exactly. Your memory is not exact. Because you you have said that you want you want to know. You're afraid to find out. But you but there's a part of you that wants to know. If it doesn't happen, genuinely, then it doesn't happen. I'm not going to be upset. <gasps> Matthew seems <gasps> to like the attention and pampering he's receiving from the detective and the psychologist, who are treating him with care and catering to him as they try to locate the bodies. The detective almost sounds fatherlike as he's talking to Matthew about doing the right thing, almost like a mentor. And the psychologist takes on a nurturing maternal role oh in her gosh, soft spoken and nauseous. calm way. Matthew's severe emotional immaturity appears to have elicited this sort of care from them. You know, drive you, let you see, and you kind of see what happens. I mean, let me ask you, or Chris may ask you an occasional question. But that's all, that's all we're trying to do. Okay? Okay. We'll try to put your jacket on. Yeah, put your jacket on. We're going to have to put a pair of cuffs on. Acting like his mom and dad. <laughs> it's crazy. Sure. For a water, do you like water bags? Yeah, we'll take a water too. Yeah. All right, do you want to go to the bathroom before we go? Oh my god, they're on the same page! They're like, we're mom and dad now! God. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Whether or not the police truly believe Matthew's claims that he can't remember what happened to the three missing people, they took him on a ride in an effort to refresh his memory. A ride! He didn't reveal anything. It's possible that Matthew simply wanted to escape from the interrogation room, and this car ride was a break for him from the intense questioning. The next day, Matthew was once again brought back into the interrogation room. This is now day four. The detective removes Matthew's handcuffs. This is a gesture of goodwill in the hopes that he will appreciate it and be more cooperative with them. <laughs> What the? It's crazy seeing them be charitable towards him. They hope he will but it's a tactic. The detective even I offers know, to heat up I his food it. again, trying to build rapport and seem like an ally to Matthew. He's just come out of his jail cell and may be even more receptive to the outside comforts they're providing him. He doesn't say thank you or appear appreciative, which further displays his antisocial personality. You guys just start me there? Oh, pretty much. It's about 9.30, a little bit earlier. you normally an early riser, or do you stay up late and sleep in? I get up early. This is just to get him comfortable with them again and get him talking. He clearly prefers to sit in silence, so this is essential for someone like this. What are your thoughts today after things we talked about and kind of left it last night with you feeling like you wanted to do what you could to help? His behavior could point to severe trauma and or mental defect. The detective realizes he must take some sort of action to get anywhere with Matthew and asks the other interrogator to step out. Chris, could you give us a couple minutes? Okay. Did you look at the camera? Okay. Oh! Oh my gosh! Did you hear that? <laughs> they're pretending like they're turning the camera off. All right. <laughs> Changing the dynamic in the room can sometimes prove useful. The detective slides his chair closer to Matthew, invading his personal space to try to snap him out of the daze he's in. This is not unusual for us. I mean, I mean a lot of times somebody wants to talk to one or the other. She won't take it personally. 
Matthew shifts in his chair, positioning himself slightly away from the detective. This may be a sign that he's trying to decrease his feelings of discomfort about the detective sitting so close to him. It's more than one time that I've advocated for the person I'm working with as a result of how things have gone. So when I tell you that, you know, this is what I'll do or what I can't do or... When the detective states that he has in previous cases advocated for the suspect, Matthew quickly looks up and makes eye contact with the detective for the first time since he's been in there. This statement has piqued his interest and attention, and the detective should take note of this and continue to use this theme of him being able to help him. What is that thing can you do, sir? This thing here? On the floor. Well, yeah, it's connected. Well, that's, all, that's just a, uh, a search uh, a converter that converts electrical current into a current that that computer works up. And that computer is a CBSA, which is a, a type of computer that um, voice analyzes voice stress. It's kind of a, one of the newer types of lie detectors that they use. So isn't the microphone? No. Despite what? Matthew appearing to be in a daze the majority of the time, this question he seems about a microphone pretty aware shows that he's to me. aware of his surroundings. Yeah. He likely has some sort of plan which is why he's wondering if he's being recorded. He's likely not as lost and distraught as he's presented to be. Mm-hmm. What's the thing in your ankle? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, that's okay. Matthew continues to delay because he keeps discussing things that aren't relevant and then asks to use the bathroom. This coffee's kind of getting me through the bathroom. Nah, yeah. you shit right there. No. Yeah, In that trash can. You take my gun or anything, right? No, you might. If you want to, you can give it to someone. Okay. Let's go. The detective is careful to not turn his back on Matthew, just Scary. in case he snaps and tries to attack him, especially after the comments about the gun. Oh, That's so oh, scary. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh, scary, scary. Talking about the gun and offering to have the cuffs put back on is a very unusual interaction, to say the least. It could be that Matthew might be aware of his own impulsivity. Perhaps he doesn't trust what he might do in a moment of impulse. The detective took Matthew to a restroom just down the hall from the interview room. I'm sorry. I feel like I failed you. I'm sorry <laughs> if I let you down. The detective is yeah. saying this as a tactic to essentially place the blame on himself for Matthew not being cooperative to see if that has any positive outcomes. I feel myself trying to let you down. I've let, let you Sarah down. I've let everybody down. Oh, <laughs> God. Sarah got recovered. They're just professional the gaslighters. appeal to Matthew's feelings about Sarah. Oh Earlier in the interrogation, he oddly stated that he took care of her. And I found her in my house. She tied up. And so I took care of her. The detective may be hoping that Matthew feels some shred of empathy for Sarah, so he'll provide them with the location of the other victims for Sarah's sake. Everything I've told you has been the truth, but you know, I'm being truthful with you now. I mean, it's not just about you, Matthew. It's about her. I mean, like I said, I think I failed you. I failed her. Law enforcement, hey, I failed them before. But, but I mean, that's, that's the package. Did you hear any of our conversation? In, no. In the bathroom and here now. Once I left, I didn't hear anything. Do you want to tell her? No, it was wondering if maybe she had been listening to any sound voices. You want to privacy, you need your privacy. So are you probably not going to keep that private? Matthew what reveals is something happening? to the detective in the bathroom that he's concerned the female interviewer will find out about. What did he say? He may feel embarrassed for her to know either because she is a female or because he still wants to appear like the victim as she was previously treating him. Our conversation, like, is this? This, the only thing, I, my intention, I'll be honest with you right now, is to just tell Chris what he said, okay? But, but I will tell you this, okay? If you... If you tell us, I will keep that private. 
The detective quickly realizes he now has some leverage over Matthew and uses it to create a quid pro quo scenario. Matthew is about to unveil a disturbing and unexpected revelation. So I had a really horrific dream last night. A what? It was disgusting. Could you not my stomach? Yeah. I'm awful. This is some really disgusting stuff. I'm a big garbage can. I was hoping I could make a, some excuse for you guys to kill me. <laughs> from what I've heard from their family, that's something that they, that would just hurt them more. And hurt yourself is not going to help anybody, including yourself. Matt said that he had it, that the dream dealt with the food processing plant, um, where they chopped food up and that there were garbage bags there mm -hmm. that were that then he opened or looked in Ray pause I need water okay <laughs> oh, okay just like that hey you know you're lucky whoever hey, you know what go then. get your water real quick wow honestly I had to go pee and I didn't get a pause oh you didn't tell me you were going pee I did I was like I, I gotta pee real fast did she say she was going pee yeah what well, my whole chat was saying where'd Mion go and yeah I was like go pee I'm mean, sure they may be in my head it's like maybe she'll be back <laughs> I even cropped the camera because I didn't think you were coming back what I, was like, I was like I gotta pee real fast oh hmm. man it's like that she thought my pee okay everyone go get their wawa go get their water let oh. me know when everyone has their water I woke Nobby up, sorry. I think for Christmas, we just do a whole day of <laughs> true crime videos. For Christmas? On Christmas Day. Well, I mean, what are you going to do on Christmas? Well, not true crime. Is that what we want to do for I Christmas? I mean, this channel is lit. I, well, we don't have to do true crime. We could do like a horror game. It, How but, about that? Something no, scary. I don't want to get killed in the game. I want to psychosize killers in an interrogation room. Bro. I think I made that word up. Yeah, yeah, I think you made it up. It's okay. No, we can't do we can't do Poppy Playtime multiplayer yet because everyone is gone. We have to wait till everyone gets back. People are traveling. They're saying choo choo. So true. Where did you find this game? It's single player. Got my water. Good. Okay, is everyone psychoanalyze? That's the word. I, what? That's the word you're trying. <laughs> Wait, well, what yeah, did I right. say? I said something. Yeah, I you said not something. Mean to say. Mm -mm -mm. Oh, Hassan's poppy play time. Did he finish? No, he hasn't every, finished, and we still have Poppy Playtime 2 that he has to play through. Every time I tune in, he's like, chat, you probably can't see, right? You can't see, and then he keeps pausing it, and I'm like, bro, I can see just fine. Just play. He was really trying, yeah, when we watched funny. the new JCS video together, he was really trying not to pause the video, but he started talking over the video, and it got to a point where... My chat was keeping track of the pauses. Oh my god, there's a pause timer. The, yeah. A pause, a pause track. count. Pa yeah. Pause all right, all right. Too. Everyone got their water. Here we go. Thank you, Justice. And um, he saw, you know, body parts, you know, chopped up stuff. And I'm not sure what to think now in terms of whether he knows or doesn't. He doesn't appear to have any concerns about the consequences in terms of trials and courts. And, and the detective reiterates Matthew's story as if he believes his version of events, but then makes it clear he's holding back additional information. This is to try to get Matthew to disclose the location of the bodies. Matt, in terms of this deal I'm offering you, okay, I mean, so to speak, deal. okay, what do you tell us what you do remember? I mean, it's, my concern again is with the location. But can you tell us what you do remember? Is this close to the well, audio there? You know, you 
I like how she's saying that he's invading his space. Offer you made to me, what you wanted to have accomplished as a result of the, the day, the trip. I figured You figured you already feel that? I mean, you know, in other words, I, you did ask me earlier, am I going to say that? And I said that, you know, I would not say that. I would not give. See, what I'm figuring is that, that, I thought that what your concern was that I didn't tell him about the desire to have us shoot you escaping. Matthew's secret is that he wants to be shot by the detective. <sighs> the detective agrees to what? keep this a secret so that he may be able to carry it out. What? This is all just a ploy to try to get Matthew to disclose the body's location, as he clearly cannot agree to kill him. And that because if I shared that, that then they would go to extreme measures. So there's no trust on either side. There's no way of proving it. There's Why no not? way you can just shoot me before my nose. You know that? If I try to escape, we have a legitimate reason. But what, but the bottom line is, what, what does all this have to do with not telling us where they are? How does that hurt things? Oh well, my God! Understand? I can't it's hard to tell if Matthew actually I believes his claim it's about so his dream, annoying. or if all of this is just him buying time or trying to play crazy. And nobody thinks that the person in this position that comes to this point does this of their own through their own fault. I'm not going to try and figure it all out, but I mean, I know, you know. Your, your dad and mom split up when you were three. You went through a life without a dad. That's a major impact. It, it affects a lot of people in a lot of really negative ways. And your dad was a 40 year firefighter and you set some fires. Okay. His obsession with the leaves and the fact that he accumulated I know, I want to know about the leaves. Of leaves in his home could be his way of coping with the abandonment issues related to his father, who oh reportedly was a firefighter. It's possible that setting fire to leaves and thus his obsession with leaves could be related to his hatred for his father or his desire for his father to notice him. Oh, People who feel lonely, God. hopeless, or empty inside often derive comfort from material objects because they might not be able to get the love and attention they want from people in their lives. As a result, they turn to obsession and fixations with things in order to feel less alone. In that Matthew's case, accumulating large quantities of leaves may have brought him a feeling of fullness and comfort. However, oh, it's also possible God. that Matthew may have some sort of mental illness and has some strange beliefs about leaves. One of the symptoms of schizophrenia is delusions. Yet Matthew doesn't seem to have schizophrenia as he doesn't appear to be in a psychotic episode during these interrogations. That's true. When he does speak, he sounds clear, coherent, and he's aware of what's happening around him. He doesn't appear to be responding to any internal stimuli, as you might expect with someone who is schizophrenic. To our knowledge, Matthew was never diagnosed with schizophrenia. With all honesty, Matt, uh, I, I say this very genuinely, you are sitting in soft pity. Oh! And that doesn't even help you. The female detective calls Matthew Tell out for his self-pity and victim mentality. This is a sign that they are done using this theme to get him to speak since allowing him to play the role of the victim has not produced any answers. Mm -hmm. She then directs him to think about the future and how he'll be viewed in the hopes this will get him talking. Wow, I disagree on that. Ugh. You do, and you can. Matthew is intelligent and knows that if he tells them where the bodies are, there's no guarantee of any real benefit to him. The most likely way to get him to give up this information would be in exchange for a plea deal, such as removing the death penalty. However, given Matthew's expression of wanting to be shot, that may not be motivating to him. They're pushing, the prosecutors are pushing to have you come and have a hearing, and this is it. This is your last chance to talk to us, literally. <laughs> um, and well, this is a lawyer present. That's what they're they're pushing for. They you're saying, yeah, you're saying you don't. You're you're still going to talk to us without an attorney. But they're that's what's being done now as far as pushing for that. So this is your last chance right now to talk to us. 
they'll so come out and make the decisions for you. Yeah. I mean, they, they literally, they'll take that away. They, they make it sound like it's your freedom to the detective knows that it's very important for Matthew to feel like he is the one in control and he is calling the shots. He makes it sound like if he gets a lawyer, the lawyer will be controlling him. He knows Matthew won't like feeling powerless. And the, the lack of media pressure can also take some of the other people that are, you know, being affected by it. Sorry about that. Okay. We're done. We apparently are told we are done. Keep everything we said in mind for you. Talk, think about it and think about what you can do for yourself after you talk to an attorney. Oh. Here are my pads. Matt, now they're going to, I mean, yeah, they're going to take you back down to jail because for security reasons, the attorneys can't be with you here, okay? Remember, public defenders have their own interests sometimes in this. You know, use your head. Okay, you're a smart guy. Take care of yourself. I don't know if I have a chance we'll talk yeah, again. I hope we do. I hope we do I'll, talk I'll, again. But, uh, you know, I'll there you go. Oh. The detective ends things on a friendly note, calling him Buddy, and touches him on the shoulder as a last-ditch effort to leave a positive impression. Ew. This is in the hopes that he may at some point change his mind and confess to the location of the bodies. The big question here is, is Matthew's strange behavior in the interrogation what? all an act either for pity, attention, or a ploy to get an insanity defense? Or is what we are seeing actually the real Matthew? Matthew later revealed that he made up the entire story about his dream about the food processing plant. You where don't he opened say. A trash bag and saw cut up body parts. He admitted that it was all a lie to try and get himself killed by the police because he didn't want to be injected with Thorazine, an antipsychotic medication, for the rest of his life. He said he still didn't remember where the bodies were. In a written confession, Matthew admitted even more, telling the investigators that he'd been staking out Tina's home the night before the attack, sleeping evil. in the woods across the street. What? The next morning, he watched as everyone left and then snuck into the home through the garage. His plan had been to burglarize the home and sneak away without anyone seeing him. He chose Tina's house because there weren't any close neighbors, oh, and the door was often left ajar. That's scary. However, Tina and Stephanie returned and caught Matthew in the act. No. He claimed he ambushed them in a panic. He wrote, I was in a total state of shock. I wandered around the house, slowly coming to realization of what I'd done and how bad it was. During this time, I killed Tina's dog Why? because it would not stop barking. Oh, God. It only got worse because then Sarah and Cody returned home. Oh. Matthew attacked and killed Cody before tying up Sarah. He wrote, I did not enter the house to kill those people. I did not know a single one of them. <gasps> Shortly after killing Tina, Stephanie, and Cody, Matthew drove to Gambier to collect gas cans from his own vehicle with the intention of burning down Tina's house. It was then that he was stopped by an officer who eventually let him go. He gave up his plan to burn down the house and instead returned to his own, where he built a campfire, burned his shoes, and drank a bottle of wine. On November 18th, Matthew finally cracked and agreed to show investigators the location of Tina, Cody, and Stephanie's bodies. Aww. It's unclear if Matthew's memory of what he did came back, or more likely, if he'd been lying about not remembering all along. He described the spot to officers where he dumped the bodies, hidden in the Cocosine Wildlife Area. As the detectives traveled through fields to a wooded area, other officers secured the perimeter. They eventually found a hollow beech tree that matched Matthew's description, which had a hole about six feet up from the ground. There was also a second larger hole near the branches. When an officer looked inside the hole, they spotted what looked like trash bags hidden inside the tree. Another hole was cut in the tree and the trash bags were examined, revealing remains belonging to Tina Herman, Cody Maynard, Stephanie Sprang, and Tanner the dog. Matthew later revealed he got the bodies inside the tree using the top hole and a rig and pulley system to drop them inside. Wow. There's some speculation that when so Matthew worked Jack as a tree crazy. trimmer, he had hollowed he out the tree himself. Remember. He hollowed out the tree! On January 6, 2011, Matthew avoided the death penalty what? by pleading guilty to 10 felonies. After everything that was found, it was clear that Matthew had a bizarre obsession with leaves. Forensic psychologists testified that his leaf obsession was delusional, and they believed that he may have hidden the bodies inside of a tree because it was familiar and comforting to him. Matthew Hoffman was then sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. That same month, 
as the leaf-filled home went into foreclosure and eventually the tree where the bodies had been hidden was cut down. Okay, I just... Do you guys think that if someone murders an entire family and they didn't mean to, but they did, you know, and they're just that crazy, do you think life in prison or death? Oh, man. Oh, man. Look, if it's super clear cut. It's just life in prison. But what kind of life? That is crazy. That is insanity. Oh, man. That's death is too easy. That is true. I do think that death is too easy. But it just kind of pains me knowing that sometimes, sometimes, life in prison is better than being homeless on the streets. Which is disgusting as well to think about, that some yeah, people like this yeah. are being treated than like people that are actually out in the real world suffering. Oh, it makes me sick. Yeah, that was crazy. <laughs>